Um, I read an article or, or a little short story rather that says uh, three dollars worth of God, please. And, and a guy named Tim Hansel wrote a book, and this was included in his book. He said, I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or snooze in the sunshine. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Does that sound like the way that we approach God? God, I want just enough of you. I, you know, I'd like to have a feel good. Maybe once every Sunday morning. As a matter of fact, God, once every Sunday morning is a little bit too much. I'll take maybe two or three times a month. That'll do. I felt toes right now. But God, I don't want a whole lot of you. I want enough just to feel good. But, you know, and, 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 and please, God, make that feel good, feel real good. And God, when I'm not here at church or maybe during the week when I'm not doing all that I should do to serve you and not being all that I should be to serve you, remember, I went to church a couple weeks ago and God, I deserve something for that. But, you know, I only want $3 worth of you. If you're relaxed, I'm not going to fuss at you. But that's kind of the attitude we get. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, if you will. Will you stand with me? You've been sitting for a few minutes. I don't want you to go to sleep on me. I'm going to be through in just a few minutes. And we're going to baptize little Karen and Beverly at the end of this service. So we're going to finish a few minutes early so we can do that. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. Now, in, in the Bible, you have the Jewish people, which are the chosen people of God, and everybody else are Gentiles. In the New Testament, the Bible takes that parallel and equates it to we being Christians as, as being uh, kind of the, the new Jewish people, but we're not, but we are. And so it, you've got the way, the way of the world is considered the Gentile way, and the way of God is considered the Christian way. So when he uses the word Gentile, he's talking about the worldly way. So let's read that verse again. Therefore I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, as worldly people walk. Walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Our Father, we honor you this day and we ask that you would minister unto us. We pray, God, that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your word. And give us a heart to receive from you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're welcome to be seated. So we're talking about His heart, our mission. I want to find out what the heart of God is. I want to find out what is important to God. And I want that to be my mission in life. If I'm going to do that, I need to find out how to get in touch with the heart of God. We talked about that last Sunday. Now I need, a, I need God to do something in my life. I need God to do something because I'll be honest with you, there is a great gap between what I know I need to do and what I really am doing and what I feel like I'm able to do. And 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 there needs God needs to do something in my life. Now, there it's really a, a, a two-pronged event. One prong is what God does. I cannot do what God can do for me. God can save me, He can fill me with the power of His Holy Spirit. But then there are things that I can do for myself that God really does not need to do for me. I told you about the story of the butterfly just a little while ago. I read a story years ago how a man one time was watching a butterfly work its way out of its cocoon. 
And he thought, you know what? It's a shame that that butterfly has to go through such a struggle to get out of that cocoon. I'm going to help it. And so he took a little pen knife, a little scalpel type knife, and he very gingerly and very carefully slit the outside of that cocoon open so that that butterfly didn't have to work so hard to get out of there. He worked on it, and he worked on it very carefully and very diligently, and finally he had the length of the entire cocoon slit open, and the butterfly was just able to come out. And then the butterfly died. And so the man was wondering what happened. And so he began to do some research, and you know what he found out? That the struggle of that caterpillar that has been transformed into a butterfly, the struggle is necessary for his survival. As that, as that caterpillar butterfly is wrapped up in that cocoon, he's all moist. There's, there's moisture, there's dampness up in there. And when he is working his way out of the cocoon, he is actually wringing the moisture out of his wings and out of his body. He's wringing out the moisture, and so that entire struggle, once he gets out, he's not nearly as damp, as wet as he would have been had he not gone through that struggle. And so what I want to tell you today is that it is necessary for you and me to struggle in this life. Isn't that wonderful news? Isn't it great to know that the struggle is necessary? I thought, I thought you'd be glad to know that. But it is. And God knows for us that it is. He knows that we need challenges. He knows that we need obstacles. He knows that we need a process in our lives whereby we overcome. But you know what he tells us? The good news is he has already made us overcomers by the power of Jesus Christ. The only thing is we just have to work at it. Some have to work at it more diligently than others. Admittedly, some people go through more trials than others. But God has a plan and a purpose in your life. And we know that Romans chapter 8 verse 28 comes and we know that all things work for the good, for those who are the called according to His purpose, for those who love God, all that kind of stuff. It is working out for you, but you still have to continue to struggle at the process. Back during World War II, there was a, a Christian man and, and his name happened to, happened to be Christian Rieger, R-E-G-E-R. -E and he lived in, in, uh, in Germany. And at the beginning of World War II, he was arrested for his Christian faith and he was put in prison. And there in prison, after some lengthy time, he began to wonder, God, are you really good? I've always believed that you were a good God, but I've suffered so in prison. I've been tortured. I've suffered. And, and I'm wondering, God, are you really good? One day he received a letter from his wife, and it was unusual, but the letter had not been opened. It had not been screened. He received an unopened letter from his wife. And he read it, and at the bottom of this loving and encouraging letter, his wife wrote Acts chapter, Acts chapter 4, verses 20. 6 through 29. And those verses say, The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord's anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And Christian Reader read that and he said, you know what, that's nice, but okay. And he went on his way and he really didn't think anything about it. A few days later, he was summoned from his prison cell and they brought him up to the headquarters. And he knew what that meant. Anytime they were brought to the main place, they were going through interrogation. And that often meant torture. What, the, what his torturers, what his persecutors were looking for was for him to be an informant, for him to give the names of other people, of other Christians in his community where he had been, where he was saved and where he lived. And if he gave those names, they would go and arrest them and either kill them or put them in prison. And Rieger had been tortured many times and he had never given up any names. But at this point, he was thinking, God, I'm wondering if you are really good. I'm wondering if what I believe is really real and really true. 
And his wife writes in this obscure uh, passage of Scripture, and he really doesn't see the connection, although it's talking some about people suffering for the kingdom of God, but he's like, I don't get that. And he's brought up to the main place, and he's about to undergo interrogation, and he's kept in an outer room. And about that time, another prisoner that has just been interrogated and tortured comes out, and he's never seen this man before. And as they pass, and other people were evidently not watching them very well, this man hands him a matchbook. And so the prisoners are used to swapping things discreetly, so he takes it and stuffs it in his pocket. And he goes in for his interrogation. He's, he's chastised. He's beaten some. He's sent back to his cell. And then he remembers, that man handed me a matchbook. I wonder what that was all about. And he takes it out. And inscribed, written in that matchbook with a pen, or is the very scripture reference that he had just received from his wife. Acts chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. At that moment, he felt the mercy and the grace and the peace of God just flood over him. And he said, God, here I am. I've been wondering, are you really real? Are you really there for me? Are you really a loving God? And now you have sent for me a confirmation from my wife and then from this other fellow that I don't even know. And it says, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Reader said at that point, God worked a transformation in his life. A transformation that allowed him to endure the rest of his captivity. Knowing that God had a purpose and a plan for him. So that he could continue to endure the struggles that he was going through under persecution. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 through 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. So folks, I'm here to tell you today that there is a transformation process that needs to take place. It is going to be difficult at times. It takes place at the beginning when you get saved and God has a transformation for you to go through and it's not all finished at once but He's working on our lives so that we can be more of what He wants us to be and do more of what He wants us to do and He says that He is faithful and He's doing His part. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 17 through 19. Therefore do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. Listen to this verse here, verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit.